On today's show, we're going to be talking snowflake photography with my special guest, Don Kamarechka. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here on YouTube at 9.30 a.m. Pacific, youtube.com slash photo Joseph, but you knew that because you're already here. Hey, if you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe thing, hit the little bell icon so you know when we go live, because it's really fun to watch the live show. When you watch the live show, you get to participate in the chat. You get to see the chat as it goes live. I could do things like this, throw this on the screen. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat room. I can address it in real time. Make sure you type at photo Joseph in front of it. And today, because we have a special guest here, Don Kamarechka, if you have a question for him, you can type his name in front of it as well. In fact, type both of ours. It'll show up on both of our screens and then we'll really know who's asking what. But with that said, I think it's time to bring in our guest. What do you guys think? Let's bring in our guest, Don. It's time to bring you onto the camera. There you are. <laughs> Excellent. Good morning. How are you doing today? Good morning. I'm doing great. This is uh, this is fun. Thank you for having me on, Joseph. And uh, this is a topic that uh, a lot of people, at least in North America or Northern Europe, they are buried in snow. We have had a harsh winter so far. And uh, it is my hopes that this discussion makes it slightly more tolerable for people. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, maybe you can send some of that snow our way, because here in Southern Oregon, we haven't had a solid snowfall yet. It's, it's, our ski mountain has not opened. It's been very disappointing. Uh, well, we just got dumped on again last night, and uh, I, you are helping me procrastinate from snow blowing the driveway. So thank you so much. Well, there you go. Now, do you have to photograph it before or after you snow blow the driveway? How does that work? Uh, well, the snow actually uh, is, is a good segue into the topic. The best snow to photograph is the stuff that has just freshly fallen. We're oh. talking uh, less than a minute ago at oh, best. Okay. Um, right. if, it's, if it's sitting around for 10, 15, a half hour, um, it's going to start to sublimate. And that means it's evaporating from a solid. So once the snowflake leaves the cloud that forms it, it already starts to disappear even before it hits the ground. Uh, and so as time goes on, as that snowflake is just sitting around uh, disappearing, if you say, oh, you know what, it snowed beautifully last night, let's go check it out, you're going to have little blobs and globs of ice that might still be interesting, okay. but they're not going to be anything like the majestic snowflake it once was. So given that it's there's a, a distance factor from where it falls, does that mean it makes more sense to get up higher altitude, climb to the top of the mountain if you're going to want to get the absolute best snowflake photography? That can help for sure. Uh, in my area, we typically get some low ceiling clouds uh, that are from lake effect snow that come from uh, Georgian Bay and Lake Huron, uh, one of the Great Lakes, that uh, it takes it about 40, 45 minutes for the snow to actually get here. So it takes uh, it takes that amount of time for nice, beautiful snowflakes to actually form. Okay. If you're right at that lake, uh, then that very low, uh, low snow that's coming in off the lake is just going to be cluttered globs of ice that aren't going to be terribly beautiful. Got it. So location is important. Uh, um, if you're at a ski hill, for example, they're often, you know, the, the, the clouds will kind of rip over the top of the, uh, of the mountain and start to, uh, you know, the pre precipitation would start there. You get some of the most beautiful snowflakes uh, in, in those locations where you've got the snow that is just created uh, by, by the landscape and, and the architecture around you. Nice. Wow. Very good. Well, that's a great intro. So for those who don't know where you are, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you are calling in from today. So I'm about an hour north of Toronto, Ontario, Canada, in, in a town called Barrie. And uh, we're known as what's called a snow belt. We've got oh. streamers of snow that come right across. And if you go 10 miles north or south of us, it's clear skies. But we might be in a blizzard here. So I guess it's a great place for me to be. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my work in general has kind of encompassed what I call the unseen world. And that's everything that I can't see with my own eyes that the camera can capture. Uh, that lets me explore things. Snowflakes are a huge component of that, but uh, it, it does go down other rabbit holes. And by the end of the conversation, we're going to get into one of those too, to Great. see how the same kind of techniques and curiosities uh, can evolve and, uh, and keep you uh, pushing your own limits. Awesome. Well, so of course, what we're talking about today primarily is the snowflake photography and not only just showing off the work, but talking a bit about behind the scenes here and how you actually do it. Because this is not this is not a simple process by any means, but it's also something that you have shared completely openly. You have you have a book out about how to actually create these types of images, don't you? Absolutely. The book Sky Crystals is, uh, or at least a, a part of the book is all the science as to how they're formed, but wow. there is a comprehensive tutorial, uh, a, a third of this 300-page book that is just equipment, techniques, um, what the camera settings are going to be, how you deal with it in post-processing, because that's a huge component as sure. well. Uh, every step spelled out. So if anybody wants to explore this stuff, uh, we can mention that again at the end, but there is the ultimate resource on it um, okay. that 
Yeah. No, I hold back no secrets. I love to share this stuff That's with awesome. everybody. It is yeah. difficult. So, I mean, bear in mind that this is not something that you're going to, you know, excel at your first attempt at. But once you get even a glimmer of something interesting, it is so addictive. You just, you, you want to go back every time. Nice. Very cool. All right. Well, very good. In that case, let's, uh, let's go ahead and start looking at some of the images. I'm going to bring up the first picture that you've got here. So tell us what we're looking at here. So you are looking at a close-up of uh, one of the most ornate snowflakes that I've been able to photograph thus far. And I put this one right at the beginning, uh, partly because it, it really reveals the, the fractal nature of, uh, of, of snowflakes and, and the physics of, of how these things are formed. But at the same time, the rarity of me finding a snowflake like that, it's like winning the lottery. Oh, and really? Oh, it, I've, I've only encountered two or three snowfalls in about a decade that have produced this kind of, of snowflake at this size and complexity wow. uh, that are this pristine and clean. So that level of detail is not what you'll typically find in every snowfall. You'll get uh, snowflakes that are covered in rime, which are like super cooled water droplets that look like they're covered in warts. And it's not really that beautiful. Um, and, uh, and sometimes you'll get incredibly beautiful snowflakes, but they're as tiny as the little hex uh, hexagon in the middle of this one. And that's as big as they ever grow. Oh, wow. So okay. uh, in a sense of scale, this one measures around eight millimeters uh, or so in size. And that's not uh, that's not the biggest. I think the biggest I, I see, found is just over a centimeter. I say, but, that sounds big, eight millimeters. Yeah, well, in terms of snowflakes, uh, the biggest gets to be about a centimeter. But most of them that you'll photograph are tiny. They'll measure between one and three millimeters across. And so... When you get into the equipment required to photograph that, uh, a one-to-one -one macro lens, like your standard macro lens for any camera, it's not going to cut it. Not anywhere near uh, close. Not even in the biggest cases is that going to be enough. Uh, and so when you're dealing with, a say, say, an average of two millimeters, if you're using a full-frame camera sensor, uh, that's going to be 36 millimeters across. Okay. okay. So if you could factor one-to-one -one life size means that your camera is going to capture 36 millimeters across the entire frame. And if the snowflake is only two millimeters, it's going to take up, you know, one eighteenth of the right. horizontal space. That's not a whole lot of space. And yeah, you know, you can crop in and you can throw away pixels, but you need more and more magnification to, to make this work. So that's sort of the predominant challenge. Number one is getting it big enough in the frame. Okay. Fair enough. Well, so let's move on to the next picture here. Cause I think we're showing a little bit of behind the scenes here of what it looks like when you're shooting. Right, so uh, this is how I, I shoot them. The lens that I'm using in this case is the Canon MPE 65 millimeter lens, uh, which you can see fully extended. It gets five times closer than the average macro lens. Okay. Now attached to that, I also have a set of extension tubes <laughs> and, uh, and that will get me up to six to one magnification. And coupled to that right next to the camera is an optic that is akin to a teleconverter. And uh, that will double my magnification up to 12 times magnification in this particular. <laughs> so um, at that scale, I still can't fill the frame with the smallest snowflakes, sure. the one millimeter and smaller. Uh, but I can get them with enough detail to make a usable image with that. Now, you'll also notice, uh, and this is very important, I'm hand-holding the camera. That was it. I was going to say, I can't help but notice here, there's no big, huge honking tripod, which is what you would usually recommend for anything anywhere near this kind of close-up photography. There, there is a few techniques here. You'll notice that my, my left hand is actually resting on the surface uh, next to where the snowflake is being photographed. Okay. Uh, and my, my index finger and my thumb are gripping the edge of the ring flash. So that acts as a very solid anchor point. Um, so the trick here is I need to get exactly the right angle of light on the surface of the snowflake for it to show up with this glaring beauty. Like a glare on a window gives you a solid white reflection back. Sure. That's what I need off of the snowflake. Okay. But if the snowflake is flat to the camera, then the angle of light to make that happen, the light would have to come from inside the lens and bounce back out again. And that's not practical uh, in this scenario. So the snowflake is on an angle. And that angle, uh, the light can come in on an angle, bounce up to the camera, and give me that glare that I'm after. So I have to find that angle very specifically by rotating the camera around the snowflake being the center of rotation, which right. is why you can't use the tripod, because the tripod is going to rotate around wherever the tripod is mounted on. Right, right. So you have to rotate the camera ever so slightly to find that proper angle. 
And then once you've got it, and you can take a couple of test shots, uh, you can see it through the viewfinder through the, I'm using ETTL on the flash, so that it gives me a pre-flash that's viewable in the viewfinder itself. That's the only reason why I'm doing it. So I don't have to take my eyes away from things and I can get a glimpse for that instant if I've got the angle correct. Okay. A and then I start out of focus and I just let my, uh, the kind of the pressure difference between my left and my right hands, uh, dictate how I can push the camera ever so slightly forward and pull back ever so slightly across the distance of a millimeter. It's going to be very, very slight. But if you control with both of your hands at the same time, the difference between the two in terms of pulling on one and pushing on the other gives you the ability to have a very smooth linear control. It's not going to be perfect, but Photoshop is very forgiving for correcting the vertical and horizontal alignments. Right. Wow, that's fantastic. And are you using any filters, you know, like a polarizing filter on there to cut through some of the glare that you don't want? No, polarizing filters probably wouldn't do much uh, okay. on a subject of, of this particular size. I would have to, uh, I, I've got some really fun experiments with light, uh, polarized light and ice, where uh, not specifically for snowflakes, they might be too thin for it. But okay. if you cross polarize the, 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 if you polarize the light source and you polarize the, the camera in the opposite direction, then you can get um, a phenomenon called birefringence, which will create psychedelic colored patterns in ice. And I've oh, wow. done some experiments with that, and I've had some successes with icicles and uh, and frost and what have you. Wow. But uh, no, th th there is fun to be had there, but not with snowflakes in general. Wow, that's crazy. All right, let's move on to the next picture here and see what else is coming up here. So tell us about this one. Oh, it's beautiful. So in, in terms of, of snowflakes, this is about as pristine and symmetrical as, as they get. But this is the result of, uh, of about a four-hour editing session uh, <laughs> that I... You know, it, it's like knitting a sweater once you've done it a couple of times. It's muscle okay. memory. It just requires sure. you to kind of go through the motions. It's not uh, as mentally exhaustive as it might initially appear. But the average snowflake is made of around 40 or so separate slices of focus. Uh, because they're on an uh, angle, you only get so much in focus at a given time. If a snowflake like this measures five millimeters across, and each you know snowflake is 40 slices, yeah, you're looking at maybe a tenth of a millimeter or so in focus in any given photograph at these magnifications. So wow. it is a kind of a different beast when you have to dive in and say, okay, well, how do I juggle all of these variables? And why, why am I even bothering <laughs> to use uh, uh, reflected light? Well, sure. reflected light, as we're seeing here, uh, and as you saw in the previous image, the background is a black mitten. That's the, the woolen fabric that is behind okay. all of this that gives me contrast uh, and uh, and some actually f a very in interesting amount of clarity. The background fades mostly out of focus. Um, mm. And it's very easy to edit out any stray fibers uh, in this particular scenario. So um, reflected light, 40 frames or so to put something like this together, and a lot of luck. These are not the kinds of snowflakes that you get your first time out. So sure. just kind of bear with that in mind. Um, but I want to show you the, the next slide, Joseph, which yeah. is when, when you've got it straight out of camera, uh, one of the images that will be furthest away from the uh, uh, the mitten, the background will be mostly entirely out of focus in that image. And so what you can do is in Photoshop, when you're playing with the focus stacking process, you can take that version that has a mostly completely out of focus background and paint that in around everything. Aside from getting into the closest edges, uh, the background will mostly completely be out of focus. And it's a very easy thing to, uh, to dive into and say, yeah, you know what? Um, that background can be easily pretty clean. So as a straight out of camera photograph, that's not bad. And if you are against the four hours of uh, <laughs> editing and you're still happy looking at an image that looks like that, I think that you should walk away with that with a smile on your face and keep shooting because, well, I am a perfectionist to get it tip to tip in focus sure, sure. you don't have I'm, I'm i'm a bit anal about that so how hey. do you know if you're doing 40 slices i i mean i assume you don't even know if you got all the slices that you need until you get into the photoshop and start stacking it together it's, it's so you drastically game. overshoot okay. uh you you don't know how many you you need right so maybe you need 40 maybe you need 45 maybe you only need 30 for that snowflake but okay. maybe you get one fewer than you expect um one of the things if you're doing this kind of focus stacking you'll realize the first time you try it you didn't take enough shots the second time you try it, you didn't take enough shots. <laughs> uh, so I'll take anywhere between two and 300 photographs of a snowflake, and I'll use however many I, I need. I get about 80% of them on the first pass. Then I get 80% of the remainder on the second pass. And then the stragglers, they kind of come in somewhere down the road uh, just to fill in any of the gaps. Wow. But yeah, um, it's always better to take more photos than you think you need. You can throw away the rest afterwards. Yeah.
Yeah. Now, the there is a question, question in uh, in the uh, the chat here that I'm seeing that uh, any lens uh, lens stabilization from uh, from Bart Johnson, uh, or would that be too unpredictable uh, up that close? And what about cameras with in body image stabiliza uh, stabilization? Would that hurt or help? Um, it's not a part of the equation. Uh, when you're using instantaneous light, uh, in this case, I'm using a ring flash, um, the, the duration of the exposure is effectively the duration of the flash. And I like to give the scenario, if you have a completely dark room that has not a stray photon of light, and uh, you set up the camera and you take a 10 minute exposure, and then arbitrarily at some point within that exposure, you pop the flash. But what is the duration of the exposure? Is it 10 minutes or is it the duration of the flash? Perfect. It's technically it's both, but we care about the duration of the flash being the meaningful one of those. So if I'm shooting at my fastest flash sync speed, which is one two fiftieth of a second, uh, and I'm using a ring flash, which up close like that, it's going to be fairly low power. Its flash duration is probably around one twenty thousandth of a second. So that's the effective duration of my exposure sure. for these images. In which case, motion blur is never going to be an issue, and image stabilization is a is a moot point. But it is a good question. No, I because think you, yeah, I think that the image stabilization where it could come in where it might actually mess things up is moving the sensor or the lens and having your images that aren't perfectly lined up. Now I know in Photoshop it's going to do that realignment for you anyway. But in a situation like this, I think turning the IS off is probably just the, the better way to go if you've got it in your camera. Exactly. Oh. Now, there is a reason why I'm using reflected light. And, and these next images uh, kind of showcase that. Because um, in this case, again, this is another straight out of camera photograph. It illustrates um, some of the bizarre features that you'll get in, in a snowflake, where you've, you've got these crazy vibrant colors showing up in the center of them that you would not otherwise expect to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is caused, I'll save you the whole physics lesson, but thin film interference, the same stuff that puts rainbows in soap bubbles or an oil spot. Um, and it's only seen when light reflects off the surface rather than passing through it. Because you can easily put a snowflake on a plate of glass and have light coming in from behind it and have it perfectly flat, uh, uh, flat to the camera and be locked on a tripod. And that's how it's been done for well over a century. But doing it this way reveals a lot more magic and surface detail and texture uh, and color that would be completely invisible otherwise. Yeah, I would say that I think your snowflake photography is certainly more dramatic and dynamic than stuff that I've seen before. So it certainly does have its own unique beauty to it. And Wonderful. in this behind the scenes image, you can see that there, yeah, there's a little bit of clutter off on the mm -hmm. side, but that's easy for me to clone out. Sure. The background is often fairly pristine. And in the next image, you'll see the fully uh, composited version of this, okay. where I've rotated it to fit the frame nicely and it's completely in focus. And, uh, and fr from out of camera to what you see here in terms of adjustments, mm -hmm. it's really minor stuff. It's just adjusting mostly the white slider, maybe a bit of uh, the temperature balance to get it ever sl so slightly cooler than neutral okay. as you want snow to have a kind of a cool feel to it. Sure. Yeah, those colors are natural. I haven't done anything in, in any, any sort of black magic uh, or secret arts to uh, to bring that out. That was nice. just what Mother Nature dropped in front of me that day. How nice of her. Now, this next image is showing, we're seeing something totally different in a snowflake. I threw this in this? here because they're, these are some of the exotics. You know, these are not... <laughs> expect a snowflake to be. Um, in certain temperatures, they'll grow into columns at warmer temperatures. And if those temperatures then cool, you'll have plate structures growing. And if that same snowflake transitions from one to the other, you'll get a column that starts to grow plates out of either side. And it creates this weird pedestal of ice type shape um, that are very small. These measure about a millimeter or so in size, but they are just beautiful gems in the right conditions. Wow. Um, and uh, the, the other one next to it uh, has right angles, which you almost never find in snowflakes because mm. they, they grow with six sides and 60 degree angles. But if you get some bizarre uh, growth where a prism facet kind of breaks out from the rest and you can get 90 degree angles forming that uh, almost defy physics because you can't even grow that in a lab because the parameters for which they form is so un... I, I don't want to say unknown because we do know how they form, but uncontrollable uh, in a way that, yeah, it just it becomes luck. You never know what you're going to find when you go out. And I've been shooting snowflakes for, I don't know, about 10 years now, almost 10 years. And uh, I'm still finding surprises. Sure. You, it's a really fascinating subject to explore, even though it's, uh, it's kind of the definition of insanity, you know, doing the same thing multiple times and expecting different results. But you get different but results. Yeah, so it's not insane. That's just totally normal. Exactly. Or I've been losing my sanity one snowflake at a time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of snowflakes fall, my friend, so you got to watch out if that's the case.
Oh, oh, exactly. So <laughs> just to wrap up this one particular topic, uh, magnification is key. I use a ring flash to light them because it gives me uh, an easy to control light where I just move the camera and rotate it around the subject until I get the light reflecting back to me in a very uh, a very useful way that shows me the surface texture. Um, and you can see on the, the 3D one, the, the pedestal, I've got the surface reflection on the column, but not on the plates on either side. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not as reflective. You can't win all battles, so you just have to kind of choose where <laughs> fall. Um, and uh, again, all handheld, all two feet from my back door, immediately as the snow is falling. Um, is that really you now, do all of your shooting just at home? You don't you don't go elsewhere. You know, I, a lot things. of people have asked me, it's like, well, what are the snowflakes going to look like in Iceland or in Siberia? Well, they're going to look the same as they look here. Uh, yeah. Just depending on what the conditions that they have there on that particular day, the conditions at home might not be the same. So. Um, there, there might be some environments that are more conducive to certain types of snowflakes, but I can see it all here. You know, it, it, some might be rarer than others, but sure. yeah, you know what? The right conditions that are calling for the big, beautiful tree-like snowflakes are at three in the morning. Well, I set my alarm and I go and check it out. And uh, sadly, I'm mostly disappointed. But sometimes <laughs> you, know, you, you see it and you shoot for the next few hours. But yeah. the best conditions will typically only last for 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, wow. Well. So once that passes, then you can uh, – one of the strategies that I do um, is – if you've got those beautiful, big, gigantic snowflakes, I do a bit of what I call dumpster diving, uh, where I'll take my, my mitten and I will lay it out over the snow that has just freshly fallen and lift it back up because the fibers of the mitten will act like Velcro. Okay. And then I can flip it over and I can take some of those freshly fallen snowflakes before they've had a chance to seriously sublimate. And then I can manipulate them usually with a small artist paintbrush just to isolate and uh, okay. secure one from the clutter, and I can keep shooting that way. So, yeah, it dominates my winter, this particular subject. I would imagine. But what if, uh, what if, Joseph, what if we don't have snow, but we have got really cold temperatures? We can have fun on our own um, with, uh, with making freezing soap bubbles, which is the next topic which to jump into. Next topic, here we go. And uh, these are like beautiful little, you can call them artisan snowflakes. You can see the uh, little snowflake shapes coming up inside this, this freezing bubble. Um, that is in the exact same location where I shoot my snowflakes. Uh, if you've got temperatures that are, uh, I'm going to guess around 8 Fahrenheit or, or colder, uh, about um, minus 8 to minus 20 Celsius is, is where these, uh, kind of, oh, so 14 Fahrenheit, I guess that would be. Um, Cold. But in, in that scenario, once it's cold enough, and you blow a bubble outside, it will start to freeze into these crystal structures. So you're you're so, talking just bubble like you play with your kids, blowing soap bubbles, one of those little toys. Exactly, except I, I typically use a straw, and so I can okay. blow it and have it dangle on the end of the straw, and then I can carefully just place it exactly where I want it to be. Okay. And uh, the, the bubble mixture, there's one key thing in this. It's six parts water, two parts regular plain old dish soap, and one part white corn syrup. And the white corn syrup is important because when you blow that bubble, that corn syrup will pool on the bottom of the bubble. And then when you drop that bubble down, it'll act like a cushion and prevent it from popping uh, most of the time. So if you don't add that extra ingredient, then your bubbles will just pop as soon as they hit the snow. Okay. Uh, and with it, they'll pop half the time, but you'll, you'll get much better results. Um, now, the key here is lighting and time. Uh, you don't know necessarily exactly where the bubble is going to fall, so I do this freehand as well. Uh, and the lighting, if you move left or right just slightly, it's going to change. So in the background, I have a, uh, a fairly high-powered flashlight, okay. and it is passing through uh, a Fresnel lens that is mounted on the table there that is just refocusing the light because flashlights, they want to spread out, mm -hmm. but you want that light condensed right over your subject itself, which you can see on the right edge of the table uh, which is where that bubble is kind of sitting, basking in this glow of light from, from this flashlight. Sure. Now, a very, very bright flashlight. You don't necessarily need one that bright. Um, it's just so that I can get it far enough away that if I'm shooting the bubble, the flashlight itself is not going to be in the frame, so the background is dark around where that snowflake is, or uh, where the soap bubble is. Okay. Uh, and it kind of creates this kind of inner glowing effect that would be hard to get otherwise. So you're shooting into the bubble towards the light, Towards, your towards light the light, and the light is just out of the frame to the top. Got it. Um, and that allows you to uh, to s sort of see these crystals as they're growing and forming around. Uh, and I'll typically be shooting on on rapid fire, uh, you know, burst mode. Mm -hmm. 
just through the entire growth of the bubble. And oftentimes, right when the things are about to completely freeze together is where it's its most beautiful. Once it's completely solid, it doesn't look as dynamic and as interesting. Okay. Uh, so I just, when I get myself within that zone where I can find the, the proper focus and angle, uh, then I just hold my finger down on that shutter button. And uh, sometimes I'll move myself forward and backward just ever so slightly because I don't know exactly where that focus is going to hit right. through the front area of the crystal. Uh, and so I'll at least have something to play with as I, as I put them together. And I hear uh, a comment in the chat room that that is a gigantic mug of bubble mix um, <laughs> on the table there. And that's partly, partly because uh, volume. If I can have it at a higher volume, the bubble mixture itself won't freeze too quickly and it will stay a liquid for a longer period of time while I'm out shooting in the frigid weather. So mix more of it than you need and uh, it'll stay viable for longer. If it gets too cold, then you just go in and stick it in the microwave for a bit. Now that the bubble itself, is that what we're seeing on the right there? It looks like a huge bubble. Is that what you're shooting? Is that, or was that just a, a glitch? In the, uh, that glitch, that bubble measures around two inches or so in size okay, so and that's, that's a huge bubble size yeah that, that's the typical size for a bubble if you blow them any bigger than that they'll probably still work uh, but the bigger they are the uh the more they will kind of compress themselves gravity will make them less spherical okay uh and uh so the smaller gives you a, a more spherical bubble although to be honest if you were adventurous enough in post you could make make it spherical if it's flattened out anyhow so um, with the bubble since these bubbles are obviously so much bigger than a snowflake this seems like something would be a lot easier for people to photograph than the snowflakes, a lot yes less no. specialized uh, equipment to get into. Yeah, so you, you need lesser magnification. A regular macro lens will work perfectly fine for you to do this. Um, but timing is very key because that bubble will freeze solid in about five seconds. Oh. Um, it, well, at least in the scenario that I typically like to shoot in, if you've got temperatures that are warmer, then you get this kind of slow creeping frosty growth from the bottom up towards the top. And that can be interesting too, uh, but it's less dynamic and... Uh, one of the key things for this, uh, I didn't mention it before, but if you have any whisper of wind, just go home. <laughs> Don't even try. Uh, because these things will shatter to pieces uh, if the wind starts to rustle them when they start to freeze. Mm. Uh, so the calm, cold days, especially you know when you've got the clear nights, uh, and we've got one actually coming up tonight in my area, it's going to be ideal. The, uh, the wind is going to be less than around um, eight miles an hour uh, or so, and I've, I shoot in a little alcove that's somewhat protected, and that will be ideal for this kind of shooting. Okay, very good. So you've got another bubble photo up here. Let's pull that one up as well. Yeah, so I, I typically shoot them on snow, but uh, just as an example of different surfaces you can throw them up on, sure. uh, this is on a uh, on a branch of my Christmas tree. Oh, okay. So I just you know snipped a, uh, a bit of that off before we uh, sent it out to the curb to be collected uh, by the garbage folks and uh, used that as a prop for these <laughs> uh, photographs. Now you'll notice that there's more color in this particular one. Now, one of the key things that I'm doing here is when I'm using that Fresnel lens to refocus the light, it's a cheap piece of plastic. They're also called cheap magnifiers. Um, they make bad lenses. Uh, so they like spray light and, and kind of break up the white light into colors in certain ways that normally would be a disadvantage. But that takes the white light from my light source and kind of sprinkles a little bit of color into the mix just by using that uh, that modifier to refocus things that's improper and really, really cheap that you can get for $5 on Amazon, uh, we'll add in a little bit of extra color to make things a bit more magical. Cool, that works. Let's see, you got another one in here too. Uh, this is where things start to get interesting um, because I, I did something different. Instead of using water uh, for the bubble mixture, I substituted that with invisible ink. <laughs> and so, Invisible ink looks clear to the eyes for the most part, uh, but it fluoresces heavily under ultraviolet light. And so in this case, this is photographed using UV lights that are uh, sort of all around the bubble. And it looks like the bubble is kind of glowing from within. And what you see is the little light specks all around. Um, those are bubble guts from the previous bubbles that popped uh, before this one that I tried to get to freeze. Okay. Uh, and they just kind of sprayed invisible ink all over the, uh, the holly branch and the snow that is surrounding it. And so in this case, these are... Uh, uh, these are more challenging because you have to have a special light source. But, I mean, you can build your own ultraviolet light for a couple of hundred dollars. It's not that expensive in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and start to play into a totally new area of photography that very few people explore, even though it's approachable if you've got the right equipment. And it 
costs less than a, a new sparkly lens that you're trying to, uh, to, to, you know, drop $2,000 on or whatever yeah, sure. it is that you're fantasizing about. So yeah, to, to explore a brand new area of photography, ultraviolet is really where things, uh, they have been evolving for me and it has been part of my winter and summer photography, which is kind of the last rabbit hole that we're going to talk about. Okay. Very good. Well, that does take us into the next picture, which is completely different. Yes, um, this is a uh, um, a flower that's in the asparagus family, uh, and <laughs> this is uh, this is lit exclusively with ultraviolet light. Okay. And what's bouncing back to the camera is uh, is what fluoresced from that plant. So if you could imagine, I'm hitting it with just ultraviolet light, no visible light whatsoever. So if the subject itself doesn't fluoresce at all, the image would be black. There would be nothing there to see. Okay. So. The interesting thing is a lot of things in nature, you know, you might think of millipedes and scorpions that you can find in your garage with a, you know, a, a black light flashlight. Now, they're heavily fluorescent, but everything fluoresces to some degree or another. Okay. Um, so certain flowers, the pollen, like in this case, the pollen is glowing quite brightly. The petals, which were a static shade of yellow orange, now vary from like a yellow color through to a deep magenta purple as you spread out from the center of it. Um, and the uh, the certain part, uh, I'm not even sure what the inner stem like leaves are. Uh, they were darker green, but they're glowing quite bright under ultraviolet light, and it creates this really surreal still life photograph that is something you can't see with your own eyes, but you're able to capture uh, with a, a regular unmodified camera. You don't need any special equipment to do this. Um, and this was not even done with a macro lens. This was done with a regular 100 millimeter lens that I just put an extension tube on to just, just shift the focus a little bit closer uh, to fill the frame with it. Um, wow. And we've got some behind the scenes uh, imagery to, to go through with this as well. I think the next one here is showing some bleeding hearts. And uh, I was using, I think that's the Panasonic uh, GH5 that I've got in the background there. Good choice. That I was, uh, that I was experimenting with trying to uh, see what its uh, low light capabilities were. And so these are three ultraviolet flashes that I, that I had modified. And uh, you can see that they are put at point blank range. Mm -hmm. They are as close as they can be to the subject without being in the frame itself. Um, and they're firing at 100% uh, output, one to one power. Oh, wow. Now, how do you so, modify a flash for ultraviolet? Is that something you can um, do? Yeah, well, I will say that the initial caveat, uh, you're dealing with high voltage electronics. So if you're not familiar with how to deal with that, look it up, research it, be prepared, take the safety measures necessary. But okay. that being said, um, if you buy, like these are young Nuo flashes, and you buy it specifically for this purpose, and you take it out of the package, you can pretty much guarantee that the capacitors inside are discharged. Uh, don't put any batteries into the flash, because if the capacitor inside is charged, uh, you could kill yourself. Okay. Just putting it out there. Um, Excellent. <laughs> It is a five minute modification to, to, to take these flashes apart. There's like two screws and a couple of little clamps. All you have to do is pop off the top of the flash head and there are two pieces of plastic in there that are designed to refocus the light, but they are also UV blocking plastic. Because if you could imagine, xenon emits ultraviolet light, but you don't really wanna give your subject a, a sunburn at the back of their retina when you're taking pictures of them. So they block the UV light by nature uh, or by, by design. So remove those and you turn the flash into a full spectrum flash. Oh. Now what you need to do is limit it down to ultraviolet only. And there's certain filters called a UV black filter uh, that will block out visible light, but let ultraviolet light pass through. And uh, you know, these ha there's varying filters out there uh, with different uh, you know, components or coatings or whatever it is. Uh, I found a combination of two separate filters works the best. Um, the Hoya U340, uh, which is readily available on eBay, uh, and you usually have to go through a uh, distributor to get uh, the next one is a mid-opt from Midwest Optics, uh, the mid-opt BP365. Um, those two together, one will bleed a little bit on the purple side, one will bleed a little bit on the red side of the visible spectrum, but together you narrow it down and you make it exclusively UV. Okay. Um, I buy 77 millimeter filters. You can get smaller ones. The bigger size just covers the flash head. Sure, entirely. sure. Okay, so that's uh, what we're seeing on... Yeah, it's, so yeah, I just there. put them on with gaffer's tape, Got and uh, and it's a simple solution there. And so um, they uh, they will only let ultraviolet light through, and then the camera in complete darkness will capture the the image that results from the setup. Is the next slide? There we go. Wow. 
So there you have a fluorescing uh, bleeding heart. You'll notice, of course, that certain parts will fluoresce slightly different colors, uh, and it really has a, a fun, almost creepy uh, <laughs> look to it in this case. But uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. When you've got those, uh, those flashes operating at uh, point blank range, this is a single shot or a single flash output at ISO 3200. But even if you have just a single flash, what you can do is you can set in complete darkness maybe a 30 second exposure and just pop that flash multiple times oh, okay, sure. throughout that time and it'll aggregate the amount of light that you're using and makes it uh, easier to use just a single flash to get uh, decent results with, with this kind of a setup. It's incredible just the amount of light that you're needing once you're looking at the UV. Since you're talking about three lights at full power at point blank range, if this was a standard flash, that would be an insanely bright exposure. But you said you're shooting it, was it you say 16 or 3200 ISO? 3200 ISO in this case, yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, wow, that's not much light yeah, coming out it, of this. Well, you're, you're definitely getting to the extremes. It's not that there's not a whole lot of ultraviolet light. If I were to be, to be recording the UV light, I've got cameras that are modified to collect ultraviolet light specifically. And certain flowers will have patterns that insects see uh, that we can't see with our own eyes. Mm. Uh, but if I were to use that camera in this scenario, it would be, again, way, way, way too much light. Okay. Uh, it. But it's how much light will fluoresce that will hit that subject um, and, uh, and, you know, through an instantaneous, uh, sort of phosphor process, uh, will come back to you from, uh, a very high frequency light back in a lower frequency light that happens to be in the visible spectrum. Okay. Uh, don't want to get all sciencey nerdy about that, but, um, certain elements, certain ingredients will fluoresce more than others. Uh, okay. pollen and certain flowers are known for it. I'll use artificial fluorescence, um, in terms of invisible ink, as you saw, uh, ultraviolet powders and stuff that you can sprinkle on things to add mm. a little bit of extra magic, but it is the natural fluorescence. I think that makes things really magical. Uh, and I mean, this is the world under our nose. Uh, it's a world that we would never be able to see otherwise, uh, including the cicada that it has clear, like transparent wings. But when you photograph it in ultraviolet fluorescence, those wings become uh, like a science fiction shade of blue. And it's really fun to see. Uh, and cicadas are very docile and, and uh, cooperative insects because mm -hmm. I, I just found this thing out on my driveway and I picked him up and I placed him down on this flower in my studio and he stayed there. Uh, uh, you know, maybe 10 minutes later, he moseyed on to the underside of the flower, but he was cooperative. And uh, then I just put him back outside afterwards. That's great. Well, I guess someone in the comments saying, Burns stuck in the comments saying, it reminds me of a Tim Burton movie. Yeah, I'll, definitely. It, has that it does have that kind of feel to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's fun to note that this is just a version of reality that we are uh, unable to normally see. And I, I guess nobody could really see it because the sun does not produce exclusively ultraviolet light, right. which would be needed to see things fluorescing. And I would not want to live uh, around a sun that only emits ultraviolet light. <laughs> I think that would be a bad thing. You're probably going to uh, be bad. And I think it's worth but, just pointing out, I mean, it's obvious, but just to repeat it, that this is not colored in Photoshop. This is not a bunch of, of oh, I took a normal picture and when it is some kind of funky color painting or some funky filters, this is, this is what your camera captured. This is exactly what the camera captured. And uh, thankfully, uh, the cicada sits still, so there's a bit of focus stacking involved just to get it nice and sharp from tip to tip. But there's no manipulation of the color overall. Um, and, and that's really what becomes magical here. And since, since I found some of these live insects, I, you know, my accountants think I'm the strangest guy ever because uh, <laughs> I go to eBay and I say, okay, let's buy a whole bunch of pinned insects. Uh, you know, different cicadas from Africa or, you know, different dragonflies or bees and, and what have you. And so when that shows up on my, uh, on my expense reports uh, for my corporation, my accounts are like, Don, you can't, you can't be serious. How is this possibly a business expense? <laughs> and then I show the pictures like this and they say, yeah. okay, well, I guess so. I, I guess so. Um, but it, it's really fun to just explore this in, in your own backyard. And so this next one here uh, is a dragonfly, a 12 spotted skipper uh, or skimmer. And um, this guy, th this is somewhat controversial to some people, but mm. dra dragonflies are not as cooperative as a cicada would be. So uh, this guy is not going to uh, cooperate if I capture him in a net and try to place him on a flower. They don't listen to commands. Um, so this guy was cooled down in my freezer for about two minutes, okay. which forced him into his night mode to think, okay, well, it's time to nap. Um, and then I took him and I put him on a, um, a bee balm flower in, uh, uh, in my studio. And so some people don't like manipulating insects in that particular way. And I'm kind of on, on either side of the fence, depending on what it is. Yeah. But there was absolutely no way to get this shot 
sure. of a dragonfly without having to go through those extra steps. Uh, and it was perfectly fine. I let him out. Uh, he actually, right after the shot was taken, he started flying around my studio. And so I had to uh, net him up again and let him back outside. But no, it's, uh, it was an interesting experiment because I've, um, I've tried to just kind of do a quick capture of other dragonflies with the net and just shine an ultraviolet light on them to see mm -hmm. if their wings do anything interesting. And they don't. They're all transparent. This is the only one that I found wow. that had these same uh, iridescent wings. And you can see patterns in them, almost like veins, where the, um, the thickness uh, of the wing is, uh, is, is, is thicker and the fluorescence is thereby brighter. And these patterns would normally be invisible to us. Uh, if you were just looking at it, it would look transparent. Uh, but you can kind of see the strength and the structure of the wing uh, in this regard. So, um, yeah, it's you don't know what's sitting like just the universe at our feet, I yeah, call absolutely. it. Whether spring, summer, winter, doesn't matter the season. There's always ways to see the world a little bit differently uh, in macro photography. And I think that the real lesson to take away from this is um, just experiment and explore. I mean, there is so much for you to explore with the macro lens. So long as you decide to stop seeing the world through your own eyes and to see it through, you know, the, the size of a, a camera like uh, <laughs> this. Like when you see like the size of the, it, it is a massive camera. Yeah. Um, you don't necessarily need to have something that is this big uh, <laughs> in order to make the shot work, but it is the tool that I have at my disposal. Sure. And so that that's yeah. what kind of makes the magic happen. It is great to see what can be done. Yes, there is some specialized equipment involved, but what can be done in your own backyard? It's so easy to get complacent in photography and just go, oh, you know, there's nothing good to shoot today. I can't find it, I'm bored. And this is, like you said, it's the universe at your feet. It's a whole different world that you can go start exploring, finding the goodness in. And, and the beautiful thing about this is, I mean, how many photographs have you seen of the Eiffel Tower, of uh, Antelope Canyon, of Horseshoe Bend, of, you know, the name any waterfall in Iceland? Um, I mean, they have been photographed to death. And if you're a landscape photographer and you get jazzed up about going to those locations, as I do too, I mean, I'm not going to uh, poo-poo that too much, but um, the photograph that you have, good or bad as it may be, uh, is one of millions of the same subject. And you might have your own slightly unique twist on it, but it's still so similar to so many other photographs sure. taken over the past many, many decades. And yeah, it's pretty much a guarantee that somebody has a better one than you, no matter how good you are. <laughs> There's a million photos of it. You know, it's really hard to yeah. be number one uh, yeah. on, on that marker. So when it comes to macro photography, however, every shot is is so varied and so unique that you're not really comparing yourself to other people at that point. You're not saying, okay, well, I took a better shot of, of this landscape than you did. No, you, you took a, a unique photograph mm -hmm. of something that to you is something, nobody else is going to have that photograph. Nobody else is going to go on that same adventure, that same exploration. Uh, and so the source of inspiration and creativity is boundless. Excellent. Excellent. Well, before we go to the last slide and talk about your book, I want to make sure that if there's any questions that want to get answered, folks, if you're, for those watching live, if you have any questions, throw them up there now. We're getting ready to wrap this thing up here and make sure that we get them. We're seeing a lot of very positive comments and other people are really loving the work and some, uh, some real encouragement in here. And I think a lot of people are getting inspired by what they're seeing, which is, which is fantastic. That's what we want to do here on the show is get people excited about photography, go out and try new things and, uh, Check out the good yeah, stuff. Yeah, uh, and, and there is one question here. Uh, yeah. uh, Jonathan Hart is assuming that the ring flash on my lens was modified as well. It was not. Okay. It is just a standard ring flash. Uh, for the snowflakes, I'm just using plain old white light coming back. Um, and uh, and so that ends up being you know, what you need uh, to, to get the, the full spectrum of color back in there. Sure. No trickery uh, within that type of stuff. Uh, however, uh, I have tried to modify a ring flash um, that uh, I did not dis discharge the capacitors on properly, shocked myself pretty good, and broke the flash. Aye. So I need to buy another one. Um, <laughs> that, that was a, actually, if you're talking about ring flash and what works really good for this sort of stuff in terms of gear, the Young Nuo uh, YN-14EX uh, is the model number. It is a, a knockoff of the Canon uh, MR-14EX. Uh, which is a remarkably good flash, but the Young Nuo one is almost identical in every possible way, and it's about one fifth the price. Yeah. We'll so, put links to all of the the gear that we're talking about today in the comments down below. So for anybody who's watching who wants to explore some of this gear, we'll be sure to list everything, the flashes and the filters that you talked about. Uh, I'll make sure we get everything from Donna and include that down there. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Bart's asking, is there a reason you don't use continuous UV light? And I would guess it would be about the amount of output, because if you need to flash your strobes multiple times if you got one, it's probably that, but. 
I, I do have a continuous UV light. Uh, it's something that uh, you know, cost me like 500 bucks and it's used mostly for, uh, you know, forensics uh, than it oh, is right. for photography. Um, and it is a very uh, high output. It's the highest output that you could get, but it's still really dim in comparison to uh, what I could get from the flashes. Right. The, the uh, downside is it will also heat things up. Uh, it generates a fair amount of heat when it's on continuously. And if you're trying to use um, like a subject for focus stacking and you're trying to block out all, all available light, you might even be draping something over it, it gets really hot. It actually worked to my advantage in one case though. I was shooting ultraviolet fluorescence work uh, for the Discovery Channel documentary film called Mosquito. And uh, I'll, I'll send you a link to the behind the scenes of me actually working on this stuff too. Because awesome, we'll put that down below. Um, but um, the heat on a mosquito that I was working on, it was a dead pin specimen, but it was freshly pinned, caused the wings to move on the dead creature through the focus stack. So as I pulled the focus uh, from the frame using 30 second shots, the wing actually moves uh, that I had no idea it would actually do that. And so yeah, continuous light in some cases can work, although that was a fluke. And they ended up using that, that as the lucky. title card for the documentary. So that was a oh, really wow. lucky mistake. But um, yeah, the flashes are the best way to go. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. All and right. one final question, uh, favorite millimeter with macro, 100 millimeter is by far the most versatile. The lens that I'm using here is 65 millimeters, but it's a really odd duck in the sense that it can extend its magnification to a greater degree than your average lens. 100 or 105 millimeter, that is really the sweet spot for macro. work. So if someone has a macro lens right now, ideal 100 millimeter or whatever they might have, and they're interested in playing with this, but not really ready to invest in this five to one macro lens, are extension tubes gonna be the most cost-effective way to do that? They're going to be very cost effective, you know, like a hundred bucks, maybe 150, depending on the set that you buy, but it's not that, uh, that much. And if you also do a lot of nature photography with a telephoto lens and you own a teleconverter, what you can do is you can add the teleconverter to the macro lens. Now, oftentimes they don't couple together properly because of a lens protrusion on mm. the teleconverter itself. But if you put the extension tubes in between the lens and the teleconverter, that covers the lens protrusion and you can couple those things together and that will double your magnification right away. Well, all kinds of great tips. Very fun. Cool. Thank you so much. Let's bring up this last slide here. I know there's a couple things we wanted to talk about. The book, first of all. Why don't you tell us about this book that you have? Right. So Sky Crystals was a book that I, uh, that I wrote wrote specifically for scientists and photographers, the people that love this natural stuff and want to create these images for themselves. Uh, it's a 304 page hardcover book that I now actually have as an ebook. Uh, and uh, it is the resource on photographing and understanding snowflakes. So if you want to do uh, or even just dabble or understand what that subject is all about, then, uh, then by all means, this is available to you at skycrystals.ca. And for your audience exclusively, uh, Joseph, if you put in the coupon code photo Joseph, you'll get $5 off either the ebook or the physical copy of the book as well. Um, now, you're familiar uh, with the, uh, the new podcast that I have out because you were a guest on a very recent I was episode. A re I was a guest, that's right. And so Photo Geek Weekly, uh, we're at episode 12 right now. And uh, so we just started up late last year. And it is a really fun down the rabbit hole of geekiness based on whatever photographic news happens to be, uh, you know, come up that week that we can kind of dig under the hood on and uh, and see all the inner workings of. That's what the podcast is all about. And awesome. uh, so every week I've got a co-host, a, a co-pilot, and uh, it's always a, a fun chat to have. And looking forward to having more people listen to that as time goes on. Very good. And if well, you we'll link to that down below as well. And it is really a fun podcast to listen to and to be a part of. So I encourage everyone to subscribe to that one. Perfect. Thank you. And, uh, you know, finally, if you want to learn from me in person, I love teaching workshops. I do a lot of, uh, in, in my own studio and in our award-winning gardens, I've got a day long macro photography course. Uh, if you want to learn water droplet refractions from me, which basically turns a droplet into a lens, putting a flower or something in the background, which is just so much fun. Um, then I've got those workshops over at my main website, doncom.ca slash workshops, if you want to get right there. And uh, I do private one-on-one -on -one workshops as well. I've got somebody that booked me uh, to, to kind of come last minute, whenever the conditions are right, to do snowflakes and soap bubbles and stuff like that. I can't do a group workshop in advance for that. It's got to be a last minute thing. Sure. And I'm more than happy to accommodate those for anybody willing to jump on a flight at the last minute too. So Sounds good. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again for sharing all that with us. Really appreciate it. Again, we'll put all the links down below for everything that we were uh, talking about today, all the gear for those who want to play, and of course, the book, and appreciate the discount code for that. Just use Photo Joseph to get your discount on that one. And you have, you have one very special edition hard copy 
left, don't you? You were telling me about this yesterday. I do. Did, did I you do. grab I, it? Do you I, have it there? I couldn't grab it. Uh, I know. I, I I wanted to, but it's actually stored on like the top shelf with a bunch of other stuff in front of it that I would have to either get a ladder or, uh, and, and with the short lead time that we had to get going here, I wasn't able to grab it. But I do have a custom leather bound, uh, you know, custom embossed in a very special uh, collector case. It actually has an extended gallery of images uh, that were not previously published in this version of it alone. Uh, my production cost on it is around eight hundred dollars, uh, so it sells for a thousand. Um, but hey, you know what? If you want that uh, and you are serious about it, I will happy, happily show you more pictures of it. And uh, that five dollar discount code will work on that one too. <laughs> Excellent. And that you have one of those left. You said. I, well, I technically I have two, but one I'm never parting with. Fair enough. No, fair enough. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on today. It was a lot of fun. Everybody, thanks again for tuning in today. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to put them in the comments or the chat down below. And I'm going to encourage Don to try and uh, follow up on those questions. I know some of you are going to have some questions for him. And he's obviously a busy guy. I don't know if he'll get to all of them, but uh, I'll but You know him. what? I love the interaction. If yeah. anybody has any questions, email me. Talk to me in any way that you want. Uh, I'm, I'm available. I, I don't sleep as much as I should because of it. But hey, I... <laughs> and wh where, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, so, you know, uh, twitter.com slash doncom, D-O-N-K-O-M. Uh, Facebook is doncom photo. Uh, you can find all of those links on my website, doncom.ca. Uh, they're just all along the bottom so that you can follow me and keep up with my work. The snowflake stuff that I do, I post them every other day online with lots of science and tech tips on how to get the images. If you follow my streams, you'll see all of the, the fun antics that I'm up to. And there's always a narrative that goes with every post that will either describe what it is you're looking at or how it is you can take that picture yourself. So it's always keeps you engaged. All right. Well, wonderful. Thanks again for coming by. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.